So welcome everyone. I'm really happy with this venue. I think it's very plush, except for the no smoking part on the balcony. Uh, apparently a loophole. Somebody figured out some sort of legal loophole uh, to smoke on the balcony. Not that I'm encouraging that at all. What were you smoking? That's the question. That is the question. We were actually blasting up on DMT on the balcony. Can everyone see us OK? Can everyone hear us OK? Is everyone doing OK? Great. So James is out here for the Maitreya Festival, which was unfortunately cancelled. And uh, we decided to have this event to sort of have him speak more to the people who weren't going to Maitreya. And probably, I don't know how many people here actually were going to go to Maitreya, but it's probably maybe a handful or so. But Maitreya was cancelled. Here we are. James get a chance to talk and uh, share his his uh, insights and wisdom, and we get to, I get to, I get to tag along a bit. <laughs> so uh, maybe you can talk about yourself, James, and your work. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm here from Canada. I've been here for a week now, and unfortunately, that week did not include Matreya. But um, my work actually is kind of full circle right now because the main foundations for what would become my, uh, I guess, my theories, my ideas, and my books around psychedelics, mushrooms specifically, started in my time in Melbourne when uh, un uninitiated into drug culture up until getting here, I became deeply initiated and started using very, very um, destructively. And I guess for some people, we'd say comparatively, it wasn't really that bad, but contextually to my own life and what I had been uh, exposed to up to living in Melbourne and taking a lot of drugs. It was pretty intense and it left me really shaken when I finally managed to kick the constant drug use and uh, go back to Canada where I was then living in my parents' basement, obsessed with conspiracy theories, really, really angry. Not to down conspiracy theories, but my relationship to them was a very destructive, somewhat um, somewhat mentally unhealthy uh, in, that, in that sense. And I was pretty messed up and I felt like I had a lot of, uh, I felt like if I didn't get help, I wasn't going to be okay. And I didn't trust psychiatry or psychology for whatever reasons that one wouldn't trust the uh, institutional um, psychiatric care. Though, I mean, I'd love to talk about um, psychotherapy later because it is actually quite good. Uh, I decided to start using mushrooms and I started using them once a month, every month, mostly by myself after the first couple times of being with somebody else at about a four to five gram ratio, not Terrence McKenna alone in a dark closet so much as myself alone in the woods meditating and saying, show me where it's hurting, help me to heal. And after about 13 months, my entire life had changed. I was on the other side of Canada and uh, I had I had found a good community. I had a good job. I was happy. I felt in line with my passions. It was like whatever it was that was holding me back, say the the toxins of my psychic, my, the psychic toxins left over from my destructive drug use habits had been cleared. I had come to deal with a lot of the pent up emotional stuff that was preventing me from living a happy, healthy life up to that point. And it empowered me to be that happy, healthy person I wanted to be, as well as laid a foundation for self-reflection and self-analysis and presence to my emotional being that enables me to continue to step forward into this world amongst the dynamic confluence of crazy shit that's going to happen to us as humans and all the negative emotional feelings that are going to come up in the process. And so that's, I guess, kind of my work is sourced in this. It's about uh, utilizing the mushroom not to meditate with entities and, and not to trip out and have just like a fun time, not to say that those two angles don't present some sort of value in some way, but to use them from a very serious perspective of looking at who am I emotionally and learn how to uh, become present to the emotional honesty that is there and to become present to uncomfortable emotions and to learn how to know the shadow. And I guess like uh, my book here, the first one I wrote, to uh, decompose the shadow, which is to allow it to uh, allow it to nourish you instead of pushing it down beneath you, secretly letting it control you. 
so that I guess that's like a rundown of my of my of my work and what I do. So for myself, um, I have my book. I'm not as prepared as James. It's, it's over there, um, and my book is all about uh, psychedelics and my views about what the most constructive ways that we can take psychedelics and what they, my views and perspectives about what they are and how they work with us and what it means when we experience what we're experiencing with psychedelics. Um, I think there's a lot of, I think science can tell us very little about what psychedelics uh, can do because what they can do is so vast and so big. Maybe what we call science in a few hundred years will have a better explanation and understanding. Uh, for myself, what I can do is say, this is what I think is going on. This is how I think they work. This is how I've seen them help people. This is how I've seen them harm people. This is how I've seen good ways to use them. This is some bad ways to use them. This is what might not work. And so I think that in the world today, there are a few people actually standing up and saying, actually, I'm doing this, I'm taking this, because these, these, all these psychedelics are illegal. And there's a reason why they're illegal. It's because some guy jumped out of a window, I think in the late 60s in America, and then anything that was psychedelic was banned. Um, by uh, the American government. And then that became, in 1971, a UN convention. So there's no intelligence behind this, this blanket illegality. It's just a, it's just, let's ban that. Kids are gonna start chewing on trees. They're gonna jump out of windows and decide that war isn't as fun as they thought it was, you know? So I think we're a bit beyond that now. I think we're in a different era. Um, and we're in, a, we're in an era where this is really coming out in the mainstream media. Uh, and, and you're getting a lot of scientific reports about mushrooms and other psychedelics being good for the brain, being good for the body, and being uh, useful for healing conditions like PTSD. So people like me and James, I think it's really significant that we're standing up and saying, hey, this is the research that we're doing, that, that how we've understood how this helps us and other people that we know. Um, so here we are to talk about this subject further. And particularly what we're experiencing in the world today is a lot of people drinking ayahuasca as a medium for healing, as a medium for uh, self-inquiry, as a medium, medium for shamanism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that mushrooms are vastly underlooked and um, I have the third edition of my book. I have a little section about mushrooms that I put in there because I had people telling me, do you hate mushrooms? What's wrong with mushrooms? Uh, so I had to write about mushrooms in there. And I do believe, just like Terence McKenna, five plus grams by yourself, this is fundamental yoga. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is amazing and I think that that um, uh, James's story and James's what he's he's mapped in his own journey is something that's lacking in a lot of people. Is this in this serious yoga of actually doing it, actually taking it, actually doing it? There's a lot of people talking, and there's a lot of people going to these ayahuasca groups with relatively weak ayahuasca and the guy with the feather and people, you know, jangling around. But you know, taking strong doses of mushrooms. That, 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 is, that is some serious work and it's, it's the reason why it's underrated and underexplored is there's no obvious tradition behind it. Whereas ayahuasca has the, the Amazonian tradition, um, in, you really only have Maria Sabina, who was a Mexican shaman woman and just assorted random shamans and what they did with it. There's not this cultural backbone that you find, but people like um, me and James, it's like finding the attention and finding the benefit. And so part of this talk is to really inspire you to see, to see how you could, um, how you could utilize not just mushrooms, but um, other psychedelics.
So actually, I know that you just made a comment about um, Marina Sabina being the only, like, I guess, culturally referenceable lineage around mushrooms, the Mexican one, which if any of you have seen the film uh, Little Saints by Al Oliver Quintanilla, who uh, captures a Mexican, like a contemporary Mexican mushroom ceremony, you learn that even, even that tradition has been long since lost because the, uh, the hill tribes of the, of the indigenous Mexican people that were using the mushrooms kind of got you know, chased out by the conquistadors and uh, in order to maintain their relationship to their religion, they had to sort of absorb Christianity into it and then the contemporary mushroom uh, ceremony, at least the one that he presents, is actually very, very established in Christianity. So in a way, even that Mexican uh, Marina Sabina style uh, ceremony has kind of gone too. But there are ones that are, are still present. I know that um, there's uh, still like, I, we were just talking outside, Druidic traditions that still use mushrooms. I know that um, Mike Crowley, he has a book called The Secret Drugs of Buddhism. He talks about mushrooms being used in ancient India and um, in ancient, uh, oh also, this might interest you, Julian, that uh, in ancient India there was usage of uh, Syrian rue and acacia trees uh, in uh, what they call, I believe they called it Amrita in the, in the Rig Vedas and stuff like that. That's what he pr proposes it is. And so there, there are these traditions, but they're mostly lost. And in the sense that they're not available to the people who have the mushrooms in their hand because they just bought them you know, in a bag from their dealer and they're going to go out and use them. And rec I, I don't have anything against recreational use. I know some people like you know, Julian, you said, the science isn't isn't gonna doesn't know how to really deal with these things. Like I personally, I fucking love science, but academia is not looking at the picture in its fullest, broadest, broad, broadest potential. And um, in that, there's a lot of poo pooing, I suppose, on recreational use. And I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. But if we don't have any other options, then we're just kind of like stuck splashing around in this shallow pool of bright colors and cool sensations and, and awesome music. And we're missing out on this really powerful opportunity, specifically with the mushrooms, to say, all right, do this yoga, this like psychedelic yoga, which is really a very still yoga, and it's surrendering to the discomfort. Now, I called, I called my book Decomposing the Shadow because I feel like the most beneficial ones are the ones that say, all right, here is all the shit that you're not looking at. And if everything that you do has a source of shadow in it, and this is where I think why I said psychotherapy is interesting, psychoanalysis and looking into psychology can be really functional for people's lives, is that everything you do has a shadow to it. And if you don't know what the sh potential shadow behind what you're doing is, chances are it's going to control you and it's going to control you in a way that hurts others and hurts yourself and your relationships to others. And when utilizing mushrooms with the reality that the hard stuff and the dark stuff can come up and knowing how to navigate it in a way that teaches you a little bit more about how to see those things, feel those things, let those things out, uh, will enable you to live a healthier life. And so without, those, without that available to us, you know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is you're going to play with them for a little while and eventually it's going to get too intense and you're going to freak out or somebody's going to freak out. Guaranteed, one of you in this room know somebody or are somebody who was like, oh yeah, mushrooms were great until I had this one trip and now I can't do it anymore, which is like all of a sudden it got real and you didn't know how to handle it or somebody didn't know how to handle it. And I believe this leaves these contorted little knots of like post-traumatic stress disorder wrapped around a very essential aspect of yourself that needed to be seen in that moment, but instead there was resistance and there was tension and there was anxiety and that gets logged into who you are. And so in building the tradition, that's, that's what these two books are about, is laying out the, all right, let's not worry about what Marina Sabina is doing, let's not worry too much about what academia is doing, let's not worry too much about the recreational thing, but let's take from all of it and say, all right, so what does it mean for me, myself, right now? No shamans, no guides, no feathers, no, you know, whatever. I, what does it mean for me to take this and just look at myself? And that, that's the kind of tradition that I feel is most functional to Western people right now. And it's the one that we all need because we're all fucked up. And I think this is the other thing. There's a lot of, unfortunately, this is what we most resist. We resist looking at ourselves. This is really hard. People have a lot of fear. It's not easy. The states it takes you into are really hard. 
this is not fooling around anymore. And I, but I think what I've been experiencing recently is just as a, as a species, you know, we really need to get our shit together collectively and individually. And that, you know, assuming that you're, you're Mr. or Miss Perfect, okay, you should be doing the yoga. And then if you're not helping out this planet, go, go and assist other dimensions of being and do the work there. But as it stands, this planet needs a lot of work. Other people need a lot of work. There's a lot of work to be done. So let's do the work. <laughs> so uh, so to, to me, I, I kind of jump back and forth with this, this idea of doing the work because what it represents I think is really important. And in another way, I think that it's also important that we keep a bit of a, a caveat that says that yes, do the work, but not like, oh, it has to be a drudgingly hard work. It's extremely challenging. It can be very uncomfortable. It can be very, very dark. I mean, if for me, what I believe is happening is you're, you're getting an increased amplitude of emotional, psychological, and spiritual significance to everything that's happening outside of you and inside of you, with mushrooms specifically, and it's all coming up and you're reacting to it, and so it can be really, really full on. If it's, if it's fear specifically, say like, fear of uh, being manipulated or fear of being attacked or maybe it's um, the fear that's wrapped up in facing grief of someone who you care about that's died and there's all this stuff wanting to fly out of you now in the form of like extreme grief in the middle of a psychedelic trip it can be really really difficult but at the same time i like this concept called um psycho spiritual maturation it, it's a key theme in, in both of these books that i have here that is to say that there's a part of us that is naturally who we are, right? And then there's a part of us, there's parts of us that are adaptive compensate, like adaptive conditions that we express as a result of some sort of trauma or some sort of event. And it's extremely difficult to differentiate between what's an adaptive strategy and what's an authentic behavioral characteristic because we're just all contorted up with all our experiences throughout the course of life. And that, that's, I think that's perfectly great because that helps us have an angle to grow through and that's a part of being alive. But that with psycho-spiritual maturation, this natural developmental process, it says that as soon as you like click to that part of you that is that natural characteristic, that if you can go through the dark side, you can cry it out, you can scream it out, you can be present to the full emotions in the body and in, in the surface of your awareness as it's, as it's coming out of you, when you hit that point of like, oh, here I am looking directly at my true self, these authentic characteristics, and it doesn't have to be the light stuff. It's like, this is authentically me grieving. I now understand what grief is because here I am. Here I am, grief. Then we will just naturally align. It's not even, it's not so much work as it is, uh, uh, not all the time. It, uh, it's not so much work as it is surrender. And then once we're there, we can just naturally more likely align to it, that, that most authentic expression of ourselves. I think also that th there definitely is a recreational component to, to mushrooms and as intense and, and uh, uh, overwhelming as it can be, it can be incredibly beautiful and awe-inspiring and you can experience the most wonderful, magical um, moments and experiences that you can have in your life, which, which can really give you a, a great sense of meaning and inspiration. So I think this is stressed, I think, in perhaps the, the, the perspective of the psychonaut, you know, this sort of vertical ascent and have all these wild crazy experiences but I think there needs to be or it doesn't need to be but I think it's useful to have a balance so that you're not just seeking these experiences but you're seeking your own growth you're seeking your own evolution you're seeking you're seeking healing for yourself from the planet and everything and I guess that's what I'm calling the work and then when you do the work and you go deeper and the rabbit hole gets deeper the rewards get bigger as well so that's and they become you know you will experience a level of reward that you have might not have 
no comprehension before a few years prior or six months prior or a few minutes prior. So there is that aspect. When you do the work, you are rewarded and there is this amazing level of beauty and uh, brilliance and uh, uh, a kind of uh, illumination of one's consciousness that is perhaps stressed too much in the psychedelic, Western psychedelic literature. Yeah, uh, I think this is probably a good place to segue towards um, relationships because, and I, I really I appreciate you bringing that um, bringing that important point in about how beautiful this experience can be too, right? Because life isn't about hardships. <laughs> Obviously, it's taking psychedelics isn't about hardships so much as it's about facing what's honest and sometimes transcendental bliss is what's honest in the moment. And and if you go through the dark. If you go through the darkness, chances are that's that's what you're going to earn on the other side. Maybe, maybe not. But the the part that I was just referencing to go into about relationships is that <clears throat> in uh, I don't know if anyone's taking notes, but there's this man who does uh, I guess like personal development psychiatry types type stuff, and his name's Robert Augustus Masters, and he presents this idea that there are three areas of growth in every person, and that we need to keep a balance of all three of these throughout the course of a lo our lives because they are seemingly interdependent, interrelated, but one line of development can be overemphasized and other ones lost. And these, these three lines of the de development are the personal, the interpersonal, and the transpersonal. And one of the things that I kind of sometimes get a little defensive and reactive about and have to I like write angry essays and then need to step back and get somebody to look at it and tell me where I'm being a dick and when I actually have reliable information so I'm not releasing dickheaded statements onto the internet but uh, is when people become over fascinated with the transpersonal aspect they become over fascinated by you know the bliss or like the bla the breakthrough or whatever it is and they forget that what if we're really to, to create really beautiful expressions of ourselves I think that the most important area of doing that isn't in the psychedelic realm so much as it's when we come back and we're relating to each other. This is the interpersonal aspect of ourselves. And so for me, for me, my relationship to the transpersonal when it comes to psychedelics has more to do with learning how to connect with what feels like the essential essence of life that streams through all things and to really feel as though I can call that awareness in and know that it nourishes me, that it slightly lifts my heels like a zephyr towards the next moment of my life and the next moment of my life and the next moment of my life, always in presence. This is what's important to me about the transpersonal. And then the personal is to go into that stuff, like go into the dark part, like what, where, what emotions am I not realizing that I'm holding inside of me that are manipulating the way I'm viewing this context so that I end up lashing out at other people for things that they've never done because my views are totally contorted because I have this leftover bogged up emotional stuff since way back in the past and where did it come from and how did I learn it and how can I become a different you know person that's the personal work you know like how did my mommy and daddy mess me up like what did what did their relationship when I was one teach me about how I relate to men and women now in my life that's the personal work and then the interpersonal is okay so what does this mean for when I talk to another person what does this mean when I get into the relationship with a lover wherein all the guards the persona like you guys are just for the most part, I'm open and vulnerable here, but you're seeing my, my persona, and you're seeing a lot of probably your own stuff coming on to me more so than actually who I am. But if we were lovers, you would see me for who I am. Not only would you see me for who I am, you'd see me for the parts of me that I'm trying to hide, and then as soon as they get seen, a subconscious part of me will come in, and it'll be like, oh, you know, like that's, they're trying to attack me or something, so I go on the defensive, and they're doing the same thing, you're doing the same thing, because you're my, lover now and then there's there's all this stuff that comes up the old patterns the old leftover stuff that the the psychedelics mushrooms specifically the mushrooms are my most trusted medicine that they uh, they show us that it's there and then when it applies is actually when we show up in our relationships and the lovers are a great way to do that because they call you into a place of vulnerability and if there's gonna be a place where we actually we actually step forward into our next sense of self, utilizing psychedelics as, a, as an avenue to do that, then it's definitely in our interpersonal relationships, whether it be 
um, with friends, strangers, lovers, or family. And this is something that uh, I was first attracted to James's work when I came across his website. What was the name of that, um, that audio clip you have on your site? Conscious Relationships and Psycho-Spiritual Maturity. So uh, it's, it's on a band camp. Uh, you can find a link to it on his audio page. And I was, I was very impressed when I heard that because I feel that we were coming from a similar sort of place that actually this was especially related to the interpersonal realm. Um, a lot of Eastern spirituality is about renouncing the world and all human beings and going off into the forest and having your chakras open and becoming the Buddha or becoming enlightened, right? So it's, it's, it's becoming detached from other human beings, becoming detached from the world. And I think there's, there's quite a movement in the, in the world today, in the, in the Western world, the last few decades. And I talk about in my book where, where Greg LaHood talks about what he calls New Age Transpersonalism, which is actually, um, yeah, I guess uh, that sort of idea of vertical ascent, of reaching a higher state. And in that state, there's an avoidance of the personal the, the transpersonal, the interpersonal. And I think this is, real, this is where the real work is. And it's, and it's a day-to-day, -day, it's a day-to-day -day work. And I think the value of the psychedelics and the mushrooms and so on is you can have an idea of the expanse of life, the possibility, but also in my own experience, as I you know, grow and evolve and heal, my daily life becomes quite extraordinary in terms of the interpersonal realm because the world that I was shown and how things supposedly worked in my culture, and I also travel a lot and see other cultures as well, that I see this interpersonal realm is so vast and so huge and there's so much there if we dare to tap into it, if we dare to engage with it into what I can only call intimacy. And if we have intimacy as our aim, as our object, I think it's quite hard to go wrong because, uh, or at least it's harder to go wrong. We might go wrong, but also there's a whole lot of behaviors and expressions that, that simply, simply uh, uh, prevent intimacy from occurring. Right. And when we, we adjust our, our brain chemistry and our body to actually desire human connection, intimacy. And, you know, I, I grew up in northeast Victoria. Um, in, in Australia, in a culture I find quite alienated. When I was in year 12, my, I was uh, quite a renowned photographer in my school and my state. Uh, and my photography project was all about the alienation of people in the city. That was my photography uh, uh, profile. And in somewhere like Australia, people are so alienated from one another here. People, people, uh, there's 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 a lack of community and uh, and and connection. So I think that 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 when for me, at least, in this work uh, occurring over many, many years, this is where the value is, and and this is what this is what religion. You know, this is not that I'm a big fan of religions, but this is what people have been trying to tell us. Wise people have been trying to tell us, you know, from Rumi to Jesus, and so on and so forth, that uh, that. That uh, intimacy, relationship, love, whatever you want to call it, is fundamental to to what it is to be human. I completely agree. Yeah. I think in in cultivating intimacy, if we ask like, what does it mean to be intimate with another person? What defines intimacy? And I think um, one, I guess, word. And I'm sure all of you will feel this as soon as I say the word. Like one word that we can remember and say like this. This is what I'm working to cultivate with this other person is vulnerability and a sense of confident vulnerability not uh, confident in the sense that it's like okay 
I know that if I let my guards down, I could be heartbroken. I know that if I really let this person in right now, they could shame me or judge me or attack me in whatever way, but that I'm just, I'm prepared to do that, and that's okay. Now that can also be a, a rather destructive pattern because I'm sure you have met people in your lives that are on either side of this vulnerability, dysfunctional vulnerability spectrum where they're hyper defensive and they never show you anything and they like will literally attack at any sign of asking them to be vulnerable, right? And then the other side of it where they're just excessively vulnerable and there's always something that you've done wrong or you, that there's to complain about or they're always crying and that's like a type of poor me, one side being like an aggressor, the other side would be like a poor me. And then maybe another side is like aloof and then another one's an interrogator. That's a, I don't know, that's from the four insight or the Celestine prophecy several years ago. I don't know if you guys. <laughs> Many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Circa 14 year old James. Um, but yeah, that vulnerability piece is, is ex extremely important. And we can only be as vulnerable with another person as we are with ourselves, but oftentimes it's, it's learning to trust in the good intention and the heart of someone that we really care about that allows us to go to a place of vulnerability that we can't go on our own. And same with psychedelics. We utilize a perceivably external stimulus, right? I'm being really clinical about this, but a perceivably external stimulus to trigger a specific type or expression of vulnerability wherein the experiential characteristics are dependent upon the psychedelic use. But we're asking for vulnerability, right? And then we're paying attention. I, uh, Stephen Gray, he, uh, he's a man, he was on my podcast, he talks about cannabis and spirituality. He's been drinking ayahuasca and peyote and everything else for since the 60s or something, and he says that one of the things that he learned in the, in the Native American church with peyote was that the central intention was shut up and pay attention, right? And so I think that in a way, um, in a way that's, that's another thing that psychedelics offer us. I guess I kind of got myself tripped up there for a second because I started talking about something else, but vulnerability is the key point and psychedelics are a way to trigger that vulnerability. And another thing too is it's not so much about the process, right? And I talked about the darkness coming out and the crying, a process I call the mode of psychosynthesis or also called catharsis or um, purging is another term, right? Depending on the tradition. But that psychedelics give you almost like an education on how to look at yourself. Mushrooms I feel were a great tool for me to learn how to self-reflect. Ayahuasca, I'm not really sure what I'm learning with ayahuasca just yet. I know that it enables me a lot of opportunity to release things and look at and be in extremely uncomfortable situations and learn how to really, really surrender and have no other choice to surrender. Um, but mushrooms, they teach, they've taught me to self-reflect and how to be vulnerable with other people. And this is really functional for the interpersonal realm because if I learn how to be vulnerable and then I learn how to pay attention to how my vulnerability triggers defenses and where those defenses are coming from, then I can probably usurp those intentions, or sorry, those defenses before they end up hurting the other person around me. Or maybe I can soften when I feel triggered by my partner and instead of both of us going into a state which only creates further conflict, one of us cannot be triggered into the state hold space for the other person to have their process and then come back and integrate and be closer and more vulnerable later instead of being in these constant ongoing conflicts or fights. So James, I just want to ask you about um, actually starting to do this, to, to do this, this yoga. You, 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 it seemed were almost like you uh, sounds like you felt you had no option that you were really seeking this level of healing and and you desired it so i'd just like to hear you talk about what you feel are the issues and the motivations in the people that you've met and to really start this 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 process to you know not not just take mushrooms once a year or three or four times a year but maybe even once a week or once a month and regularly go into it and 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 it's like almost seeing a therapist what do you think of the things that are the issues that are preventing people and also maybe some practical aspects that you feel to share with people about about this uh yeah there are multiple questions there 
The one question is about the people that I've met. Why, why are they doing this when they're doing this kind of work? And it's almost always to be a better person, ultimately. Or um, I have numerous friends who will choose to take mushrooms when they're like myself. One of the reasons that I'll take it is because I feel like something's going on and I don't know what that is and I feel pent up. I, I, can't, I can't relate to what it's like to be a female, right, because I'm not. But for um, as being a male, I'm, I'm a masculine identified male, one of the things that I have faced my entire life has been a suppression of my emotions to the point where I can't even control it when I want to cry. I can't help but tense up in my throat and hold it down. And so for a lot of people and myself, the intention is to let that out because the mushrooms help me do that. So to be a better person ultimately is the main goal that most people tell me is their relationship with mushrooms. Um, frequency was another kind of point there. I don't, I don't actually think it's good, more good or less good to take it more or less um, frequently. I actually think the more you take it, the, the less functional it will be become because if it's like going skydiving, right? So you might get really good at skydiving, but the, the intensity of the experience will change if you do it all the time. You know, if, if you ate your favorite meal every night, who gives a shit if it's spaghetti again because you don't, you're sick of it, right? In the sense that it, you, you become numb to it in a way. So I think if, if you're using it for personal growth, once a month maximum for working with mushrooms because there's a lot to unpack there. You're not, because the point is not to do it for the experience so much as what the experience can offer you in the post-experience integration, which is to continue to reflect on what you went through, to observe how you relate having gone through the, the emotional processes that it triggers, and then to apply those things directly into your relationships and learn in that process as well. And if you're doing it too often, I, I think that you're gonna I think that you're just you're just going to miss out on on unpacking everything in the in that experience. You know, you just keep adding on to it and adding on to it, and you never be able to really fully apply it all. <clears throat> Practicalities and things that I think are holding people back. The thing that most holds me back is that it's really anxiety provoking to know that I have no idea what's going to come out when I take these things, that I have no idea whether or not I'm going to spend multiple hours crying as though my tear, every tear coming out is the fullest cry I've ever cried in my life and the next one's even fuller. Or if I'm going to end up spending, you know, however long just feeling extremely lonely or extremely angry or if I'm going to come to uncover some stuff in me that has been there since my entire life that I'm not actually prepared to handle or don't think I'm prepared to handle. Like, I'm always anxious to take it. I, I think people who aren't anxious to take psychedelics for the intention of um, personal growth or, or decompression or whatever are, um, are maybe a little crazy <laughs> because like, it's, it's very intense. And I think the anxiety there is, uh, is one of the contributing factors to, to why people wouldn't do it. It's one of the contributing factors as to why I feel hesitant because it's uncomfortable and it's scary. You know, like I've, I'm up here, I'm talking to you about, you know, like, oh yeah, facing the darkness and yada yada, because in the beginning was darkness and from darkness, light emerged. And if we think that we can get to the light without going through the darkness, we're ridiculous. But it's not that I'm some sort of like, I'm not like a, I don't have like a Teflon thing that's preventing me from being afraid and uncomfortable. It scares the hell out of me most of the time. That, I think that's why it's so beneficial. I don't necessarily like it. It just seems to help me in some way. So I think that would be one thing that's preventing people. Another thing is that you don't have a community around you. If you don't have a community around you where you can feel like, hey, I had this experience and it was deeply meaningful to me. You, if you can't be vulnerable and apply it immediately into the interpersonal areas of your life and what actually happens is you're around people that make you feel guilty or shameful then chances are you're going to close up and that part of you that was just that part of you that was just about to blossom is just going to be clamped back down again probably even harder than it was before and so i think that's that's something practical that we could consider is that if we don't have people that we trust to talk to about it we probably shouldn't talk with those people and possibly we'll feel uncomfortable going there and you know the shame the shame thing looks different you know it could be somebody the obvious one is that um, you're made to feel guilty and shameful because drugs are, drugs are wrong and bad, right? Or, um, and I'm, I know I'm in a room full of Australians, please forgive me as I'm about to butcher your accent, but another way could be like, 
oh hey, oh hey mate, I just had this really beautiful experience. I came to, I was like crying and stuff. Right, you're crying mate, shut, harden the fuck up mate. You know, like, so, like that might be another way that you feel shameful or guilty, you know? Uh, other things that might hold us back, like the biggest thing is that uh, several years ago a friend of mine, I, I mention a lot of people, I don't know if, if anyone's taking notes here, but I mention people's names because I, I feel like I've had this opportunity to commune and learn from these incredible people and when I get an opportunity to share what I've learned with others, I want to mention who those people are so that you could check them out because they're inspiring and a good friend of mine who goes by the name Sky Dreamer at one point in time, before I started moving into making writing and speaking about this kind of stuff my career, he made a comment that it's not, the, it's not our failure that we're afraid of, it's our success. And I think in a way, that applies with working with psychedelics too, because in a way we're afraid, or at least I'm afraid, of how uncomfortable it's gonna be, but on another level I know that I can deal with discomfort. Perhaps the fear is the level of responsibility that will then be put on you to now live yourself as this new person to actually make the effort to become a changed person and to earn the perception of that changed person in your environment and even more so those defenses that we have around those parts of ourselves that were that are hurting that were damaged you know i i mean one common visualization is the inner child that's like locked up in the basement and with a sign on the door that's just like danger wild beasts and it's like you can get close and it's screaming and wants to claw your eyes out but when you go in there it's like visually it's just like a small crying you just sad and tender and vulnerable that there's parts of you that you don't realize are going oh no not tonight not this week oh I'm not in the mood that's actually the very same defenses that are protecting you or protecting that vulnerable aspect of yourself is protecting you from letting it out because of course it's there, it's old, it's vulnerable. It doesn't want to get re-traumatized and re-hurt. So for the ego, which is the operational sense of self that we use to, to maintain sense of self, which includes protection, it's going to want to protect the aspects of itself it's protecting no matter what and will even create worse situations for some reason, create worse situations and create a surface level frustration to prevent you from going into the real feelings that is that most authentic vulnerability that's at your core. And I think that could be a limitation as well. And to look at yourself, anytime you feel hesitant or lethargic or angry or triggered or blaming or shaming or judging, chances are what's actually happening is you were just exposed to an aspect of yourself you're afraid to look at or you don't know how to look at because you've never looked at it and that you're not actually lethargic so much as it's a, it's a covert shame operating to protect you from an aspect of yourself that's too vulnerable. So maybe you can talk about the, the shadow, James, and explore your understanding of the shadow. It's, 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 it can be a bit of a, a pop psychological word, but maybe you can elaborate, elaborate upon your understanding of the shadow and the process of working with the shadow, especially when it comes to mushrooms? Uh, well, the shadow is like a, based in the work of Carl Gustav Jung, who was a psychotherapist, a psychologist from several years ago, one of the students of Freud, um, Sigmund Freud, I believe, who came up with this concept of the collective unconscious, which is a series of a collection of patterns of consciousness that are perceivable as symbols when we observe how they are expressed in human culture and human history. And he goes to draw these archetypes, which are again these like fundamental patterns, which you could call symbols, and he isolates certain things. And one of the things that he isolates is what he calls the shadow. Other things are like the king or um, the warrior. These are more like masculine archetypes. But the shadow is everything about yourself that you choose not to look at. I believe the quote that I, I put somewhere in this book is that um, man is on the whole less good than he perceives himself to be. And if you don't choose to look at those things, then they will inevitably control you. So the shadow is the aspects of ourselves. It's the, it's not only the defenses that come up, but it's also the, the wounds that are in us. And it's the 
underlying motive of why we act shitty to ourselves and to other people. So some shadow stuff I might have might be that, um, so here's one that's getting really personal. Uh, so when I was younger, whew, this is such a big one, how do I start this? Okay, so if we were to look at how we could rear children, like uh, raise children, okay? There are three possible dynamics of energy from parent to child. One of them is parent to child, helping to create a whole balanced, um, well-adjusted person wherein that child's needs are appropriately met um, in a judicious, timely fashion with love and attention and care, and those needs including giving the child opportunity to enjoy itself as its authentic self, as well as giving the child appropriate boundaries and removing things from that child, like say scissors, you know, that protect it with, a, with an adult awareness of what's best for this child. That would be a giving proper, healthy parental relationship. Another one might be neglect. You can imagine that if the first one was parent to child, neglect is parent to anything but child. Child does not get any love, caring, nurturing, or attention. And then there's all sorts of things that could come out of that, all sorts of compensational patterns that will come up to then carry this childhood issue into the rest of your life wherein you might perceive everyone as abandoning you or you might perceive that nobody is listening to you and you might, um, you might end up doing behaviors that actually push people away from you to create an external congruence in your social situation with your inner self perceptions left over from a pattern of uh, like relationship dynamic pattern that was established in childhood before you were able to actually form conceptual explicit memories. It, it goes really deep, right? So then the other, the other possibility, you have healthy neglect, is enmeshment. And enmeshment is when it's from child to parent all of a sudden the child becomes there to basically fulfill the parents' needs. And this can cause all sorts of negative things. Like I, here's the point is that everyone in this room almost definitely has a combination of all of them and almost definitely has less of the healthy ones than the other two because that's just the reality that we're all traumatized people, which is why what Julian said about how important it is to do the work, that I agree with that, is that um, we all have these traumas. So, the child to parent enmeshment situation can create all sorts of weird things. So for example, in my life, when I was very young, my parents had moved from where they were born, which is Newfoundland, and my father was working all the time, and my mother was away from her, um, her, her normal living situation, and she was really stressed out. So when I was young, I could see that my mother was very stressed out, and that her, as a small child, I didn't want that, and then, of course, she didn't have her support structure around her, <clears throat> and she's a young mom with, you know, living with uh, one person bringing money in in a lower income family, working hard, there's a lot of stress there, and that I eventually became in this situation wherein I was there to help make sure that I didn't make my mom upset, right? That I didn't trigger my mom to get upset, or if she was upset, I was there to help her, and of course, I was also her son, and she was there to receive my loving nurturing because that was the relationship. Now, it doesn't actually seem like anything that would be uncommon. However, on a level, what that has done has created a weird situation later on in life because I love my mother. She's a fantastic mom, and I don't think that situation that she did anything really all that out of the ordinary. However, that, that time in my life where an enmeshment was established created a situation wherein now in my intimate relationships, I perceive my female partner's needs as likely being much greater than they actually are and become over-responsive to what her emotional reactions to the meeting or not meeting of those needs might be. And so I overreact and then create a situation that uh, wouldn't have needed to exist in the first place because I'm misperceiving her based on this old established pattern, which then pushes her to react in a way that justifies that she was going to overreact and that I failed and I'm inadequate and blah, blah, blah. Those things that I failed and I'm inadequate or like, you know, she's upset at me and the whole history behind it being, you know, from my childhood and stuff. And this is me being like fully vulnerable with you and I really hope my mother doesn't get upset with me for telling you guys this when this gets released on the internet one day. Um, but like that's the shadow. 
is looking at, okay, here's the uncomfortable conflict in my relationship, boom, best way to find it, intimate loving relationships. And the shadow is that inadequacy. There's the shadow. And all the defenses that lead up to that. Right? Does, this, does this make sense to you guys? And then there's multiple different, I like, again, I'm dropping names because these people are really cool. Douglas Tatarin, he talks about these core feelings. And they're like uh, inadequacy, helplessness, hopelessness, worthlessness. Like these are feelings that we have inside of us. Those are the shadow feelings and the emotional charge there. And if we can come to learn how those exist inside of us and when they're the primary referencing point for how we're building the perception of our world and other people around us, then, when, then we become empowered to work with the shadow in a way that builds intimacy and vulnerability rather than conflict and re-traumatization. Great. One thing, um, I was inspired by James' work um, before meeting him was reading The True Light of Darkness and his experience of taking mushrooms in the float tank. And I ended up in Estonia where I could get a very good deal on a float tank and um, I was gifted some mushrooms. So I tried using various psychedelics, uh, LSD, ayahuasca, and mushrooms and mushrooms came up to be the best one by far the the LSD was too scattered too crazy the ayahuasca it was it's so deep for me anyway it didn't matter that I was in the float tank but uh, with three grams of mushrooms I went into a state of absolute relaxation and I felt this complete synchronization of right and left brain and my body and my body screaming at me do this do this more this is great and so it's just like flooding me with all the best chemicals it's got as a reward system for what I'm going into it's going into a feedback loop so uh, that was actually a much more pleasurable uh, fulfilling experience than say taking something like MDMA or cocaine or something like that because you're having an experience of a deep relaxation and a surrender on a on a you know in a in a bodily sense and also there was a deep sense of integration with the self because it took the first almost two hours I was quite fidgety it took me some time just to let go and when I did let go you're in this place where you're floating you're completely floating it's completely dark there's no stimulus at all it's just you and so I think this is an especially uh, valuable um, and interesting um, way to to explore oneself even just going into the float tank by oneself and not taking anything I think could be extremely powerful for a lot of people and it is powerful for a lot of people because in that place you can't escape you've got to face what's there you you're you're, you're go it's like hyper meditation everything that is there it's going to come up and you're going to be um this process of awareness is is going to be amplified um james said that i think you, you did you take the mushrooms on the tail did you go to the float tank on the tail end also uh no i had, i had taken mushrooms in chocolate in a chocolate a chocolate elixir mm. and then walked to my friend's house where the tank was and yeah. stopped to dance on the trees and feel really good and then feel like oh you know what i don't want to go into the tank no this is good for me this is good for me and i was like no, that's defense mechanism. I must go into the tank. So I was, I actually was so high when I got into that right, guy's house. Right. Everything was just squiggling around everywhere. Like, I'm going to get in a float tank right now. <laughs> yeah, but I was, I was very high already, yes. I actually met a guy uh, recently who have, has a tattoo over his chest that says white light, uh, and which was the tattoo came about because of his experience of taking mushrooms in a float tank actually so yeah I think that it's really the one for the float tank the, the mushroom so do you, do you know many people who've explored that 
James? Is that uh, yeah, I've had several people um, tell me about it since I released the book. This is the book that Julian was just talking about, The True Light of Darkness. It's a storytelling narrative. These are like, I'll talk tell you about them later, but they're two sides of the same coin. And uh, yeah, so several people have come back and been like, oh, I took mushrooms in the tank too. Holy shit, man. Like, uh, and also, I actually, my, uh, my podcast, the next episode that launches Friday night in Australia, Friday morning in Canada, uh, talks to a guy that runs a flotation center, um, multiple centers, actually. It's like a franchise. And he talks about his experiences taking mushrooms in the tank. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's, I guess it's a thing for like the floating community is to float with mushrooms. So um, we want to sort of go out of the the personal. I know James really focuses on the personal. I'm more, uh, I'm more trying to achieve some sort of balance between the personal and the transpersonal. Um, in in my book, I go into my understanding of entities and the beings, and it's a continual refrain that I hear people ask me: Are the beings real? And what I say in the book is, well, philosophers have been trying to understand what is real for a very long time. Is the chair real? You know, is your life real? Who knows what real is? It's just a word. So where I, where I stand with these experiences and what I say to people is just experience what it is that's there, you know? Just experience it. And... I believe that the rational way, the logical way, is to to have a think about what you experience. You say, like, have a think, is that would my brain be communicating that to me? Does that look like something that brain chemicals would do? All right. No. <laughs> um, so where else could the experience be coming from? Uh, perhaps there are many, I think, as soon as you get to an explanation or you think you've nailed it or you think you've understood what it is and you say, aha, it's this, it's that, you're limiting it because the, the range of possible experience is so great. Where I've come to, to it these days is I believe that uh, the physical universe is one one band of frequency and that perhaps there are many physical universes and also that I understand there are many dimensions many 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 dimensions many bandwidths frequencies of beingness and I guess when physicists talk about alternate realities alternative dimensions they sort of, they sort of hypothesize, hypothesize these empty worlds, these empty spaces. But that's, that's the sound of one hand clapping, you know? That's the sound of no one's there to hear the tree in the woods, and there's no tree in the woods because there ain't no woods. <laughs> so that doesn't make any sense to me. It's, it's the, the, these domains of being only make sense if there's beings in there, they only make sense if there's some sort of um, consciousness or existence in these domains. And by using these, you know, mind-expanding uh, compounds and super neurotransmitters, which are facilitating an enormous amount of information transfer in your brain and facilitating a greater capacity of awareness and you know, engaging your your pineal gland and your third eye and your ability to see and perceive uh, beyond the physical realm, it makes sense to me that what you can experience are other beings and other dimensions. For me, that was obvious so many years ago. I mean, in 2002, I gave a talk and said, at, at, at the point of 667 beings, after I saw my 667th being, my mind gave up trying to, to explain it away. 
to try and rationalize it, rationalize it, try to, to say it ain't real. And now I just experience a whole lot of stuff, a whole many different beings. And as I've done this over the years, my relationship and ability to communicate and deal with the states that I go into becomes more sophisticated. And my ability to uh, communicate becomes more sophisticated. And I think telepathy is fundamental, absolutely fundamental. And that's, that's a place where you're not really using words anymore and you're able to communicate instantly in a nonverbal manner. Um, so for me, I found that to be uh, especially valuable. And I think that for, for humanity, I think this is a potential that we can experience as human beings and is our, is our, is our birthright. I do believe that uh, in, in Aboriginal culture, there is um, that that capacity has been developed and utilized and if we think about our language and how we communicate anyway and make strange mouth noises and understand each other it's completely bizarre in a way we're already telepathic but i just wanted to um ask james about his perspective on on the transpersonal and the beings and um uh, as his work is so so deeply personal, what his view on 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 the transpersonal and and in in the psychedelic community and world, perhaps, and I and I would agree with him. Perhaps there's an overemphasis at times on on the transpersonal to the detriment of the the serious personal work, which is almost um, yeah psychiatric and very nuts and bolts and human. Well, uh, I have a bit of a different perspective than, than Julian, and uh, I want to put the little caveat there, the clause that I haven't had as many entity interactions um, as Julian has. I know, Julian, you've been working with DMT and ayahuasca for several years now, and that's that's not my primary primary medicine, and so it's not really I don't really get a lot of entity interactions in a lot of my experiences. However, I have had some. And I take a little bit more of a Buddhist approach, I guess. Uh, to me, they're all just extensions of the luminosity, refractions of various aspects of the luminosity, which is like the essential essence of what is real, uh, which is the, The all that is all at once undifferentiated white light, I guess. Uh, and for me, I, there's just so many different patterns of consciousness that can be experienced once we enter an altered state. And the manner in which they're rendered in our experience is deeply influenced by a variety of things, including um, how we have chosen to set the stage for those experiences. And then there's also experiences that kind of break the mold on what we had set beforehand. And an important point to consider there is whether or not we perceive reality, which I believe reality is relative, and thus certain things always exist as being real within their own ontological context. Um, but that, um, as to whether or not reality is an experience of brain chemicals rendered in the brain, like uh, chemicals rendered in the brain that we're generating this from the inside out, or if there's something larger, bigger than ourselves, and more complex than our brain can typically render, and if what we perceive as brain chemicals and modulations, which is what I lean on, that um, alterations in, in brain chemistry and in the body are more or less um, uh, an image of consciousness perceived objectively, if this makes sense. So if I were to, um, this is Bernardo Castro, fantastic guy. If I were to put somebody into an fMRI machine and have them get aroused, right? And that uh, while they're aroused, I map all their brain changes and such, and I come out and I have this picture that shows them while they were aroused and point to it and say, that's your arousal. It's incomplete. That's what their arousal looks like objectively. Subjectively, 
it's simply an experience. And so I believe that when we're interacting with entities, we are having a subjective experience which is partially rendered by uh, the set that we went into, how we have chosen to perceive it, and then partially rendered by patterns of information that are beyond what our brain has been, I guess, conditioned to normally handle, and so it becomes very, very novel. But ultimately, I don't necessarily believe that they are, I don't necessarily believe that they are fundamentally real, objectively, in the same manner in which they are perceived as real subjectively to the user, if this makes sense. That they are real patterns of awareness, consciousness, and experience that exist outside of the normal rendering of human consciousness, and maybe out, definitely outside the, the sense of personal self, personal consciousness. However, I don't believe that they are objective in the sense that the same entity that I'm interacting with that appears the same and acts the same is the same entity that Julian would interact with. I think that they're different. They're personal renderings of larger transpersonal patterns of consciousness. That being said, I also believe that they're very real in the uh, ontological context in which they emerge. That is to say that, like Julian asks, he's like, what is real? Is the chair real? Am I real? I mean, there's lots of discussion now in, uh, say, like, um, citizen, citizen uh, philosophy that is like, what is real? Like, y you and I, we're not different beings. We're the same being, right? <clears throat> so who's to say that these, um, these entities are simply as, they're as real in the experience of the, of the altered state, in the experience of the altered state, in that specific expression of your subjective experience, as is me interacting with you now in this specific expression of my subjective experience. However, what I'm interacting with in the altered state of consciousness isn't necessarily objective to what's happening in another person's subjective experience. Now, the case is enclosed for this on me, or on this for me. And I believe that I have a lot to, uh, a lot to I guess explore a little bit more there on those ideas, but I, I have had several interactions, uh, not as not as many as Julian, and ultimately, that's that's still where I've where I've come to, is that they are both real and not real, and we have to walk the the razor's line, like the the razor's edge between real and not real, and if we fall too deep on one side, we're gonna we're gonna miss uh, we're gonna miss the point. I think not that I even know what the point is yet. Uh, I think that there's a little bit of it's a little bit of uh, taboo in the, in the psychedelic world for people to to categorically state that these beings are real, and I certainly know people who or or actually that that uh, how can we say it that actually uh, you know I believe that uh, you know they are objectively manifest manifestedly uh, vivid and I'm experiencing valid data that is as it appears to be, you know, or something of this nature. I think there's a little bit of a taboo that people uh, who they want, people want to appear credible. And if you start talking about aliens and other forms of life, suddenly somehow in our world at this time in academia, people are like, oh, you believe in little green men or what have you, and so we're just going to ignore what you have to say, right? So I think that's really dangerous. And uh, so I, I, I don't have any qualms about it. And also people have said to me that I should, in my work, I should give some sort of clause and in, in terms of um, letting people off the hook, in terms of not being so categorically definite about how I experience and you know how many people I've talked to, how many thousands of people I talk to about their experience. Uh, but it, when you look at it and when you even just going through and you read the, the DMT experiences on error, what do you read about people's psychedelic experiences? This is what people experience. It's experienced in all traditions of all cultures. Just the Western culture doesn't believe it. All cultures believe in spirits and beings, bad spirits, good spirits. So, you know, my view is aligned with pretty much all 
cultures and the odd the odd guy out his younger brother with his magic science wand trick thing and is science how is science going to comprehend or understand or measure what we presently understand as some sort of metaphysical dimension that is of another frequency of manifestation so i think um we sort of come to the end of our of our of our talking and we're going to take some questions